the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. This morning we celebrate St. Luke the Evangelist. His icon is right here. And he is one of the most prolific authors in the New Testament. Because in addition to writing one of the four Gospels, he also wrote the book of Acts. So after St. Paul and all of his letters, St. Luke has the most words that are written in the New Testament. Like uh, the evangelist Mark, St. Luke was not one of the 12 disciples. He was one of the, the apostles of the 70. So he was with Christ throughout his earthly ministry. He was sent out by Christ, as you heard in the gospel today, with the 70. But he was not one of the 12 apostles. Luke was also the one who, with Cleopas, met on the road to Emmaus, the resurrected Lord. After our Lord's crucifixion and resurrection, he came and walked with them and taught them. And in the gospel today, we hear about the 70 and their, uh, the immense power that has been given to them. They said, Lord, even the demons are sub subject to us in your name. And our Lord adds even more than that. He says, Behold, I have given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And truly, St. Luke's name is written in heaven, and he intercedes on our behalf. The power given to St. Luke, in addition to the apostolic power that we heard about in the, the gospel today, the gifts that were given to the apostles, he was also a gifted surgeon, he was very well lettered. He had, um, he had actually written his gospel in the books of the Acts, which is something of note because writing in those days was very difficult. And even when we say, oh, this was written by so-and-so, oftentimes it was written by a scribe who was writing down what was dictated to them. But St. Luke actually wrote his. St. Luke was also a gifted artist as well iconographer, although iconography was just beginning at the time of Christ. Um, and he, he hand wrote the first icons that we have of the Panagia, icons that are still in existence to this day, and sort of began, became the, the father of iconography in that respect. On St. Luke's icon, and on icons that he uh, likely wrote as well, there's a word, agios. It's usually on the top left of an icon. And it's a word that we use to describe those who are very close to God. So we would say Luke is agios. It's translated as saint, but it's also translated as holy. So that's why on the icon it says agios lucas, we would say saint Luke. But we could also say holy Luke, because in Greek the word, it's one word, and there's no big dividing line between those two words. And that's kind of important for us because Sometimes we think of the saints as these luminaries that are way up there, and we're the non-saints. And we have to abandon that way of thinking a bit. Certainly it is true that the saints, I can say for myself, far exceed my virtue and far exceed the things that I have accomplished in my life. But there's not something fundamentally different about them. Rather, they are further along the exact same journey that I'm taking as well. And that is the journey towards being agios, towards being holy. Ultimately, agios is an attribute of God. That's why we say the tris agion hymn, the three holy hymn, thrice holy hymn, is because this is an attribute of God. We learn this in Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah has the vision of the heavens, and the angels there are singing, holy, holy, holy Lord of Sabaoth. And this is what we repeat again in each and every liturgy before the consecration. We sing the same hymn. So this idea of holiness is something that actually is only God's. It is only a quality of God. And this is why the angels are singing this hymn. This is why we sing the Trisagion hymn, which was expanded. It was holy, holy, holy. Now it's holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal. If you don't know where the Trisagion hymn came from, look it up. It's a beautiful miracle that occurred after an earthquake in Constantinople in which we were divinely given these words. So agios is something that is uniquely God. 
Commonly, we say that holy means something that's set apart. That's what people often describe holy or sacred as. But this doesn't really get at what holy is. The word agios comes from ye. Ye meaning earth. And if you put an A in front of a word that comes from Greek or through that from Latin, what does that mean? The A means it negates, not. So agios means not of this world. That's what the word literally means. Now when we say not of the earth, not of this world, it means much more broadly than just the earth, the physical earth here, but it means everything created. So when we say agios, it means not of created things. But we use that word, unless we're talking about God, we use that about created things or created persons, saints. We call them holy, we call them agios. So we're saying that they're not of the earth, they're not of this world. And what that really means is that something that is holy, according to the Greek, it's saying it is someone or something that has transcended the created world and participates in God. That's the long definition of what holy means, agios. Something that has transcended the created world and participates in God. Now we think of holy things, think of the gospel book on the altar or of the chalice or the altar itself. We would say all of these things are holy. They're still created things and yet they're now, they have a part in God because they have become something else that again we commonly say is set apart or made sacred. But really what does it mean? It means that this is not just a table. We call it the holy table. That's one of the names that we call it, the altar as well. But this holy table is now not simply a table, but it's something upon which the sacrifice of God occurs. So everything that has the name holy takes part in God in some way or another. Saints are those who have become not of this world because they've united themselves to him who is not of the created world, the uncreated God. And so in this way, as God is agios, Saints are agios, or agii. But as I mentioned before, when we say saints and holy, we think of the saints as these other people, and we're the others. And when we use the word holy, sometimes we can think of that as well. But we too are called to be not of this world. We are holy ones. We are striving to be those who are united to God. Or at least we should be striving. Too often we settle for the worldly things. The things that are of this world, the physical things, their possessions, our creaturely comforts or desires. Too often we don't strive for God. And this is indicative of the lives that we lead. Is our life really different from someone else who is not a Christian? Someone once said that we as Christians should live our lives in such a way that if Christ had not been crucified and resurrected, our life would make no sense. I'll say that once more. We as Christians should live our lives in such a way that if Christ was not crucified and resurrected, our life would make no sense. Looking at our lives would make no sense. So this begins to get at that idea of being not of this world, of being holy. Because we are agios. We are not of this world. So how can we live our lives in such a way that our life would make no sense otherwise except what Christ has done? Well, simply put, that means following Christ's commandments. Just a few weeks ago, we had a very tough commandment, love your enemies, and all those other words that uh, our Lord said in the Gospel of Luke. So just by following Christ's commandments, we should live a life that is very different from those outside of outside of Christ. So there are many of Christ's commandments, and I could sit here and list them all for you, but instead of that, I'll just mention a few of the ways in which we can be not of this world. The first of these is to accept injustice. St. Paisio says, how should we treat someone who treats us unfairly? We must treat him like a great benefactor. 
who makes deposits on our behalf into God's savings bank. He is making us wealthy for life eternal. This is not a matter of minor importance. Are we not supposed to love our benefactors? Shouldn't we express our gratitude to them? In the same way, we must love and feel grateful to the person who has treated us unjustly because he benefits us forever. The unjust will receive eternal injustice, whereas those who accept injustice with joy will be eternally justified. Wait for divine justice and divine returns and be patient. Nothing is lost. In this way, you are depositing money into God's savings bank. You will surely receive interest in the next life for all the trials that you are going through now. God knows all. He looks after his creatures where there is patience. There will always, this will always fall into place. God provides. We need patience, not logic. God is watching. He observes everything in us. And we must surrender to him unconditionally. You see, the righteous Joseph did not say a thing when his brothers sold him into slavery. He could have said, I'm their brother. But he said nothing until God spoke and made him second to the king. How different of a view this is from the world around us. Some people might say, well, you know, all religions are the same. And, you know, Christians are not that different from everyone else. That's our fault. It is our fault if Christians are not different from anyone else. So there's a first one for us. Accepting injustice. Giving praise to our benefactors, those who treat us unjustly. Because in the worldly way, we say, I'm wronged, I am justified. We use that word, I'm justified. Why? Because an injustice has been done against me. Therefore, I'm justified, and I can retaliate, or I can respond in whatever way I see fit. Because I'm justified. But this is not the way of Christ. St. Porfiri- Paisios also talks about these steps of gradations. If we're not ready to joyfully praise our benefactors, the ones who are treating us unjustly. The worldly way is to retaliate. The next step up from there is to not retaliate, keep it inside of ourselves. The next step up from there is to not have any animosity inside of ourselves. And then that highest step he's talking about is to be joyful in the face of of injustice. St. Porphyrios has this to add to that thought. Someone had asked St. Porphyrius about an apparent injustice he had suffered, and the saint answered in this day, in this way. He said, one day, imagine you're walking quietly on your way, and you see your brother walking in front of you also quietly, when at once a crook jumps out in front of your brother from a side road and attacks him, he beats him, pulls his hair, wounds him, and throws him down bleeding, faced with such a scene like that, Would you be angry at your brother, or would you feel sorry for him? The person replied, How could I possibly be angry with my wounded brother who fell victim to the criminal? The thought didn't even cross my mind. Of course I would feel sorry for him, and I would try to help him as much as I could. St. Porphyrius replies, Well then, everyone who insults you, who hurts you, who slanders you, who does an injustice in any way whatsoever is a brother of yours who has fallen into the hands of some criminal demon. When you notice that your brother does you an injustice, what should you do? You must feel very sorry for him. Commiserate with him and entreat God warmly and silently both to support you in that difficult time of trial and to have mercy on your brother who has fallen victim to the evildoer, the demon. Because if you don't do that but get angry with him instead, reacting to his attack with a counterattack, then the devil who is already on the nape of your brother's neck will jump onto yours and dance with both of you. This is how we're to understand injustice. So this is one. We can accept injustice, which is not at all easy. This is our path towards being holy. The next is we can have no attachment to things not have an attachment to our worldly possessions, to the things that are around us. The world says the opposite to us. The world says, you need this thing. You need this. You just need to be comfortable. 
if you just get to this stage in your life, if you just have this thing, then you'll be comfortable. And we know that that's never the case because we bring ourselves into that next scenario. And we're still in that next scenario and still thinking, well, maybe just the next thing. That will be the thing that brings me peace and comfort is if I have this next thing. And the world gladly feeds us along on that with all of the advertisements and all the ways that they try to make desires into essential needs. Or we say to ourselves, well, I need this thing. I need this job. That might be difficult. I need this job. But if we lose it, God knows that. And he will provide all things for us. In fact, even if we lose something because of our own sin, even if we do something foolish and lose it, we have to remember that God knows that we needed that loss and it was for our benefit. We can all remember times where we've done something really stupid and we should have suffered a loss. Whether it's driving recklessly or in some foolish situation, we can all remember those times where we go, God preserved me. So we know that our sinful action doesn't always result in a loss. So when it does result in a loss, we can say, God knew I, need, knew I needed that. Because the other times when I probably should have had it, he didn't give me the loss. So I know that God is at work in these situations. The next is to live without fear or anxiety. And I know we've talked about this a lot, so I won't say much about this. But the world around us is a world that is filled with this right now. The world says to us, you have to be afraid of those people. You have to hate them. They're the ones that are going to cause you problems. St. Simeon, the new theologian, says, It is incumbent upon us neither to say nor think of any person as evil, but we must look upon everyone as good. If you see a brother afflicted with a passion, do not hate him. Hate the passion that makes war upon him. And if you see him being terrorized by the habits and desires of previous sins, have compassion on him. Maybe you too will be afflicted by temptation, since you are also made from matter that easily turns from good to evil. Love towards your brother prepares you to love God. And he quotes St. John, For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. This quote from St. Simeon was so beloved by St. Porphyrios, he used to have it printed out and he would hand it out to people when they came and visited him. So we are to accept injustice, we are to have no attachment to things, to live without fear or anxiety, and to be humble. This is the final of many things that I could say about what Christ guides us on. But to be humble really is at the heart of all of this, because in humility we can see the person who's treating me unjustly, they're enslaved just like I am. If we are humble, we can say, I don't deserve these things around me. I have them, but if I lose them, thanks be to God. The humble person is a person who is, in the words of St. John Climacus, is constantly forgetful of his own achievements. That's what it means to be humble. Completely forget our own achievements. St. Mark the Ascetic said, just as fire and water can, just as fire and water cannot be combined, so self-justification and humility exclude one another. We can't justify ourselves and also be humble at the same time. And this gets back to injustice as well, justifying ourselves. This is constantly the way of our world. If someone else has done evil, then I am permitted to do evil because of their evil. We are called to be not of this world. We are called to be agios. In the hymn that was sung this morning for St. Luke, it says, You call us all to spiritual knowledge every day and lift us up to the heavens for the love of God. Lifting us up to the heavens. This is our path of being from the ye, from the world, to being agios, not of this world. And the suggestions that I've made are very difficult suggestions. Our Lord's commandments are not by any means easy. But there's always that path that we have if they get too hard. 
If we face injustice and we're not able to be peaceful and accepted as benefactors, at least we can repent. And if I find that I really am frustrated that I have this loss of this thing, my car breaks down and I'm just really frustrated, I can repent. And if I fall into fear and anxiety, I can repent. So there's always a path forwards towards holiness. The brothers and sisters in Christ, we are not of this world. We have been marked, we have been sealed to join ourselves to Christ. Let us take that path forward so that our life will not make sense except that Christ is crucified and resurrected. Amen. Let us all say with our whole song, with our whole